we'll try and do some calculations, some actual calculations, and make some predictions and see if we can get the right answer. Um, and I'll just close some things down. Put taxes. Balance the budget. Now, I'm going to try and do some very simple calculations today, and <clears throat> what I'm essentially going to do is shut down the foreign sector completely. I'm just going to close all of the valves down here, and we'll just concentrate for a moment on the banking sector and the government sector. Well, really, the banking sector is what we're really going to look at today and see if we can um, do some predictions, do some calculations. Now, this was one of the... Um, The big, advantage, big advances that Phillips made, and I'm not an economist, but I'm told that there were quite a bit of disagreement between Keynes and Robertson about exactly what it was that set interest rates. And apparently if the pair of them had lived to see this, they would have looked at Phillips' solution to this and they would never have argued. <coughs> um, essentially, it's treating it like a... Um, a stock. One of the clear things about this machine is the way it makes a clear distinction between what's a stock and what's a flow. So you've got a big stock of money at the bottom, there's a stock of money here in the bank, there's a stock of money held abroad in the foreign exchanges and everything else is a flow. And so it's, it's the supply and demand of this stock of money competing for loanable funds. And <clears throat> so interest rates are set to, to some extent by the quantity of money in the bank via this curve at the end here which is called the liquidity preference function. So if the bank is full, now the economist has got to help me, if the bank is full we don't want any more people to save so the interest rates will go down and everyone will want to invest because money's cheap so these will all start to open. Okay, so <coughs> that's set the uh, this inverse relationship, so if the bank is high, interest rates are low, so there's a sort of inverse relationship, not exactly inverse, driven by that curve there, but then also the, the performance of these valves at the bottom is governed by these little, these little graphs here. <coughs> so everything, everywhere there's these little sliders that open and close and shut these waterfalls and constrict these waterfalls. And they're powered by these little sort of perspex graphs with these little sliders in. And as these graphs go up and down, powered by a float, for example, um, <coughs> they will open and close these sliders. Now, these happen to be linear graphs. They don't have to be linear. They could be nonlinear curves in here to do a nonlinear function. Um, so this will be the um, demand for loanable funds, I believe, as a interest rates versus the demand for loanable funds and investment here would be that curve there, a basic sort of demand curve there. Now I've taken all of the curves out except for two. There's this one here and this one here. This, um, hang on, I'm just going to make sure, yeah, I'm pegging interest rates, okay. Peg interest rates. <coughs> um, this one is the propensity to consume. This is, uh, it's called how likely, what proportion of our um, income after taxation are we going to spend on consumption and the rest we put to savings, the uh, residual goes off to savings. I'm trying to get to this equilibrium.